Well, good evening, friends. Thank you for coming. Thank you. We're so glad that you've chosen to come this evening for the second of two lectures from Professor Dr. Natalia Wenger. So, my name is John Isaac, and I direct the Center for Mennonite Brethren Studies on Taylor Avenue here in Winnipeg. And the Center is one of three sponsors for these lectures. I join with the Canadian Mennonite University, where we are here, and the Mennonite Heritage Archives, just across the street, in bringing the 2024 Friesen Lectures. This is a history lectureship, and it's funded by a longtime CMU booster, Abram Friesen. And he named it after his brother and sister-in-law, John and Margaret Friesen. We also want to acknowledge that we are gathering here on the ancestral lands known as Treaty One, the land of the Anishinaabe, Cree, OG Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, as well as the national homeland of the Red River Métis. We are grateful for their stewardship of the land and the water and their hospitality. Those of you who heard this morning's lecture titled Mennonites and the Romanov Dynasty Loyalty and Impasse. Well, if you were there, you know, you know that we're in for another very stimulating lecture this evening by Professor Wenger. She is a professor of history at the Dnipro National University, D-N-U. CMU, DNU, right. Currently, she is a faculty fellow here at Canadian Mennonite University, as well as a visiting professor at the University of Winnipeg, and a sessional instructor at the University of Manitoba. So I think you're, you're on the road quite a bit to all these three universities. Professor Wenger has spent the bulk of her academic career studying Mennonites. In 1998, she published a book on how Mennonites managed or tried to navigate the upheaval of revolution, civil war, and collectivization, 1914 through 1931. And then in 2009, she published a book on Mennonite entrepreneurship at the end of the Russian imperial age. That's just before the Bolshevik revolution. She's a recognized expert in the area of Mennonite life in Ukraine. And in this evening's lecture, Professor Wenger will talk about how Mennonites who lost their Ukrainian homeland due to the political and religious repression during the 20s through to the 40s have returned, in quote, and you see the word return in quotation marks. Because, of course, uh, they have come to the Ukraine now thanks to the new political realities when the country gained independence after or in the post-Soviet era. Now, these initial visits, and maybe some of you have been on some of those tours, these initial visits were mostly nostalgic tourism to see the remains of the farms and the churches and the schools tour participants had heard about from their parents or grandparents. But that return actually quickly evolved into something much, much more. Social, humanitarian, commemorative, economic, medical projects developed, fostering cooperation and mutual enrichment of cultures, Canadian and Ukrainian. And it's this so-called return that she'll be speaking about, that tapped into something, something deep. It helped Mennonites address some long-standing social trauma resulting from the loss of their homeland. And I know some of you have participated on such tours, or maybe you've donated, right? Donated to the Friends of the Mennonite Center in Molochansk, Ukraine. So Professor Wenger this evening is going to explore this really remarkable development and the significance for ongoing engagement, especially during the recent Russian expansionist aggression in Ukraine. Something 
which is very personal to her, as her husband Oleg is in Ukraine part of the resistance. So after the lecture, you'll have a chance. There will be a mic here in the middle for you to bring a question. And we'll listen to Professor Wenger as she responds. But this time, for now, we have the title. Here it is. The Mennonites Return to Ukraine, a dialogue with a lost and regained motherland. So please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Professor Natalia Wenger. Thank you, John. So just, it was so sophisticated introduction. I think maybe we can go home already. I don't know what it's about. So hello, good evening, Mennonite history boss. And hello, my colleagues, friends, maybe students. Thank you for coming for my lecture. It's, I'm very honored to stand here today. I'm very thrilled to be a part of Frozen Lecture. Uh, it's, it's, it's a lecture that I visited last year, and I couldn't just understand that I would present in a year. So I'm very honored. I would like to extend my thanks to everyone who has supported me in this country, provided me with valuable opportunities for self-development. Your encouragement plays a significant role in my present life. I'm grateful for your generosity, for your friendship, for your just good attitude. Thank you so much. And I start my presentations. That is very personal for me. In some ways, the discussed event are directly connected to my personal biography and professional history. In the mid-1990s, as a graduate student who chose Mennonite history topic for my PhD, I first met the Mennonite group participating in the heritage cruise of Walter and Maria Unger. I saw people who were descendants of my research characters. It was an astonishing experience to meet the past. Why did they come, I asked myself. It was easy to, ass to assume the nostalgia, but it was not a satisfactory answer, because nostalgia is more of longing for the good old days that contradicted my understanding of Mennonite history in Ukraine. It took a considerable amount of time when me, as a Ukrainian historian, began not only to know, but to understand the history of Mennonites, the people themselves, but the most important, their craving for the past. My evening presentation is dedicated to this very complex issue. Sources for my research include archival materials, publication in Mennonite and Ukrainian periodicals, as well as numerous interviews with direct participants of the events under study. I express my gratitude to those who dedicated their time to conversing with me, shared their memories and emotions, provided materials whose personal archives, archivals, archives and research papers inspired me. I still need to talk. It wasn't enough for me, and I'm very sorry that a lot of info you have shared with me is beyond the presentation. The Canadian historians, J.B. Taves and Frank Epp, called their books Lost Fatherland and Mennonite Exodus. I believe that authors deeply contemplated the titles, which are not just figurative expressions. When we say lost, it doesn't imply abandoned or rejected at all. There is a bitterness of real deprivation in this world. The word exodus is akin to biblical exodus and evacuation in the name of salvation. It describes pivotal moments of Mennonite history that had an epic essence for the congregations. Every emigration wave was a voluntary, but always a painful choice for the communities. For the Mennonites who have always toiled hard on the land in agriculture, and for whom their land was their precondition of their material well-being, 
the image of the land as a territory, as a place, as a piece of landscape, became one of spiritual universals. From, the, my, from my perspective, when the Mennonite left the Russian Empire of Soviet Union, they harbored set resentment towards the authorities, religious persecution or communist state, but never ever with the land territories they considered their homeland. In other words, the connection to the place, not to the country, was the source of their future nostalgia. Allow me to share just one quote from Bibi Jian's correspondence, who said, when we have left and are crossing the border, we will turn to our beloved Russia, remove our caps and heartily thank them for all the good things we and our fathers enjoyed in this land. We will wish Russia all the best for the future and leave. His words were not about thanking Russian government even there. He addressed to his ancestors who had achieved prosperity, remembered a metaphorical golden age which the Mennonites used to undergo in Russian empire. At that moment, he was solely focused on salvation and not a single thought crossed his mind that he might want to return. However, the years have passed and when I ask the Mennonite about their motivation for visiting Ukraine, many of them cited family storytelling, mentioned sentiments from their grandparents, relatives lost in the USSR, family pictures which stirred their curiosity. They also talk about their love of history, considered as a crucial part of the Mennonite identity. Thanks to famous Mennonite historians, Thanks to famous Mennonite historians, Cornelius Kran, David Rampel, Gerhard Lawrence, the Russian, as they said at the time, Mennonite history, was present in the intellectual life of the diaspora keeping interest to the past. When it was a reality that historical circumstances hindered the realization of their nostalgia for a long time. The Soviet Union was separated from the entire civilized world. There, the memory of the Mennonite past was erased from the pages of textbooks and historiography. And only when the special sentiment re uh, settlement regime for the Mennonites was cancelled in the Soviet Union, the first lectures from relatives were got in Canada, USA, Germany, in somehow reestablished family connections, enhanced a desire for meeting and visit. When the so-called Thor in the USSR, it's 1960s, made the image of the previously saintful country more attractive, the bravest of Mennonites were ready to travel. The idea of organizing group tours was suggested by Gerhard Lorenz. Two collections from Mennonite heritage archives in Winnipeg allow us to reconstruct some information about first travels in the 1960s, 1970s. Mennonite Travel Service conducted the first group tour to the Soviet Union in 1967. There is no to introduce Gerhard Lorenz, a renowned historian, leader of Mennonite communities, an experienced educator, who has also served as a guide for tours in 1967-76. As Gerhard Lorenz was born in Ukraine, his language proficiency, knowledge of history, and professional qualities ensured the success of the tour, making it unforgettable for the participants. Each tour was an emotionally charged experience, and according to L. Reimer, every tour produced monuments as monument drama as blood relatives for the first time in half a century embraced tearfully. The emotional intensify the emotional intensity of these bittersweet occasions is impossible to desire. The story of how Rempel Peter Rempel accidentally met his nanny appeared on the pages of all Mennonites' periodicals with the comments, Trust, truth is often stranger than fiction. Okay, no. 
The Brezhnev era with its political changes along with uh, Trudeau's visit to the USSR created additional opportunities for the tourism. Also, Ukraine and Kazakhstan the key destination for Mennonites, such trips could only be allowed by including Moscow uh, and Leningrad in its itinerary. In Winnipeg, tours were operated by the Assinibon Travel Service. Sufficiently extended tours included visit to Poland, Baltic Republic, Moscow, Central Asia, and of course Ukraine. The Soviet organizers of the tours were responsible for the ideological atmosphere and places to visit. In Ukraine, Mennonites had to visit a collective farm, a children's camp, local museum with politically nuanced exhibition. Peter Ryman recalled, we were immersed in revolutionary history. The Mennonite period was ignored. El Reimer echoes his sentiments. We were literally overwhelmed by the flow of information, and many of us were very satisfied. And immediately in the next sentence, he corrects himself. However, we already know that as a tourist in this country, we are operating under a barter system. The Soviet authorities allows us to explore some Mennonite history, provided we are also willing to participate in other sightseeing activities they have planned for us. In the diary records offer some interesting aspects of the perception of Soviet villages former colonies. Gerald Jensen mentioned that farmers from Canadian group noticed the old collective farm machinery saying, not much better than our parents had. El Reimer vividly described his visit to the hospital in the village of Waldheim. The hospital is a poor conditions with primitive equipment and depressing atmosphere. I saw a bowl with extracted teeth and blood I think many years ago, Mennonites had better equipment. This quotes attest to a certain irony among, among the Mennonites. However, they willingly accepted that compromise as it allows them to reach their cherished destination, the colonies, ancestor cemeteries, Ukrainian landscape. Each trip turned into a mini discovery. One of the remarkable findings of the 1971 tour with Larissa Goryacheva and Gerhard Lawrence was the monument to Jacob Hoppers. Hepner. After negotiations, the monument was successfully transported to Canada in 1973. It took its rightful place in the Steinbach Museum. The memories of local residents are very touching. They never left tourists without attention, treating them with fruits from their own garden or fresh pastures. Ukrainian hospitality, isn't it? Herman Ergen from the personal, uh, from uh, Mennonite Service Limited mentioned, from my personal travel experience in Russia, I found the people hospitable, the food excellent, and with some exceptions, the normal life much like ours. Some memories have political overtone. Yes, it is still. A Russian take what it's what Peter Reimer said. Russians take pride in their achievements. They express absolute confidence that they, that they will catch up with the Western world. They don't complain as we often do. And that is actually was wrong observation. Complaining was about uh, a complaint with, you know, a foreigner, it's just a kind of suicide for any Soviet persons. It's, communication is difficult, but complaint is much worse. And what about nostalgia? Also, tourists did not openly admit it. Each of them was experiencing their own emotional and psychological trauma, which they hoped to overcome by visiting Ukraine. But that, 
brought only partial results. A wonderful confirmation of these statements is quote from Harold John's article. I felt no cell sense of nostalgia or bitterness at what might have been as we drove away from the day. No longing for a tune. And yet, there was a sense of inward pain. From L. Reimer diary. Nothing I see in the Mennonite Ukraine so powerfully symbolized for me the ruined hopes of our people in this land, that this wrecked house of God, so him and church, yes, that was so elegant in its prime. As the bus pulls away, I know that the memory of this neglected Mennonite monument and the feeling it was aroused was still with me always. It seems that 1970s, 80s, visiting Ukraine became a fashionable trend among the Canadian Mennonites. During that period, the number of tourists constantly increased, drawing the KGB's attention. KGB was particularly concerned about the species of espionage and attempts by Western tourists to establish contacts with the local population. Despite the small number of German-speaking people in the, in the colonies after the repressions, there was a noticeable increase in number of staff in the KGB's department, responsible for observing local Germans at that time. Those agents also took care of the reliability of the officials of the tourism organization in tourism, including translators and archival employees. In 1971-72, a comprehensive program was implemented to introduce preventive measures against spies. To avoid conflicts, Gerhard Lawrence complied an instruction for tourists in 1975. He advised, travel light, because no laundry, take soap and basin stopper, do not bring letter, your suitcases are inspected at the, entrance of, uh, at the entrance for books. You can take just one Bible or song books, but not more, and not new edition. You can take small souvenirs for guides and relatives, a ballpoint pen, a handkerchief. If customs officials take something at the entrance, you should ask for a, rec a re receipt. Introduction regarding books became particularly important in connection with the case of Cornelius Kran in 1972, I mean historian Cornelius Kran. He was arrested and accused of distributing religious literature. For Lawrence, this became a significant signal indicating the end of the thaw. He was so possible ban of, of, of tours, but it did not happen. The following tourists were marked by professional guides such as James Urey, Leonard Friesen, Paul Taves. In the late 1980s, there was some debate about altering the travel format. It appeared that nostalgic tourism in its traditional form was no longer a prevailing trend. And Mennonite cruises, I will, I will come back to them later, responded to that new demand. As soon as Ukraine got independence, new opportunities arose for the Mennonite for a tune, encompassing both traveling and historical intervention. As independent Ukrainians endeavored to embrace democracy and open up to the West, Mennonite tourists in these uh, later years were no longer viewed as their spies, as citizens of enemy states. The post-Soviet religious revival opened positive prospects for dialogue of Mennonites with Ukrainian society. The Mennonites were no longer treated as ideological terrorists. On the contrary, their religious spirits were welcomed. One should keep in mind as the possible pragmatic motives of the Ukrainian government. As Ukraine tried to feel its way into the future, it needed support from the collective West. Any attention from representatives of Western countries was greeted. At first, local authorities sometimes harbored suspicions that Mennonites could claim restitutions. 
But these thoughts were quickly forgotten. It turned out that the Mennonite came to Ukraine to reconcile with the past, with motivation to donate to their former homeland, rather than to get something from it. In general, the Ukrainian society was open to accept the Mennonites in their projects, academic, memorial, and philanthropic. So. After independence, more than 3,000 Mennonites visited, in Ukraine, visited Ukraine in 1999, 2010, and 2018. Mennonite heritage cruises organized by Marina and Walter Unger provided Mennonites with a new, more profound concept of nostalgi nostalgic tourism. It was something that teetered on the urge between imaginary and reality, invited tourists to become part of a floating pilgrims' community. If you were ask me what is my take of the Mennonite heritage cruises, I would answer as follows. It is a community of people who long to be Mennonites once again. The cruises allow combining travels with commemorative events dedicated to the historical heritage in Ukraine, philanthropic project, and simply entertainment and relaxations. All cruise participants remember the wonderful inspiration they lingered with them for a long time after the journey. Representatives of Mennonite's academic and cultural elite played an important role in the evolution of cruises' meaning. They were historians, architects, genealogists, musicians. The emotional experience of returning home was associated not only with visual exposure to places and landscape, but also communication with the host Ukrainian community, the local population whose friendliness was no longer in any doubt. They were former neighbors of the Mennonites who unexpectedly found themselves in possession of a valuable asset, the Mennonite heritage. Thanks to such context, this heritage gained historical significance in the eyes of the locals and became a part of their shared Ukrainian history that needed recognition and care. It is, for example, about former Mennonite buildings that used to belong to the congregations and to family. A lot of personal stories can be told. For example, Ebb and Katie Bergen found their house in Ruchaevka and purchased it for their ancestors to live in. The theme of the cruises will become one of the topics of my future presentation because it is a very huge you know, topic to discuss and we have a lot to tell about. And now I would like to refer briefly to other Mennonite projects in Ukraine, just briefly. I apologize for my brevity and would ask more information from participants of the events. Mennonite churches in Ukraine. In 1991, the first small parish was formed in Zaporizhia. Its first members were either native Germans or those who chose Protestantism during the revival of religious in the post-Soviet Ukraine. According to State Department of Religious and National Affairs of the Ministry of Culture, eight Mennonite churches were functioning in the country in 2018. The department also had on record seven Mennonite pastors and six Sunday schools for children. Charity. The first idea of creating a charitable program arose in 1989 when a mission of entrepreneurs, the Mennonite Economic Development Associates, was sent to the Soviet Union. They participated in the anniversary celebration of the Kortitsa colonies, making plans for the future. They drafted memorandum, it's paper, that, is, that I think asked a lot of questions but didn't answer most of them in practice. Based on my information, based on my information, one of the notably successful charitable initiatives was a support, supporting program and of the small and medium business provided by MIDA. 
The Mennonites ran their long-term charitable projects through the Mennonite Center, founded in Molochansk in 2000. As early as 1997, the office of Mennonite Central Committee moved to the town important for the Mennonites. Planning possible charitable projects, the Mennonites resolved to provide Ukraine with urgent support aimed, among other things, at organizing high-quality health care and education for people, not only in Molochansk, but also in other former centers of Mennonite culture. The Mennonite Center is another big topic to present and to research. The Mennonite Center had been active by the February 2022. Now Malachansk is occupied by the Russian Federation Army, and as Alien Friesen says in her book, Mennonite legacy is in peril. A family center was opened in the Parisian in 2002. Their programs are for children with special needs. Two nursing homes were established in the city and its vicinity, with, uh, which are continuing their work in war conditions. Louis Zavatsky, project director, and Boris Letkeman from Ukraine report on the progress of this project and about the situation in Ukraine twice a week. So it's for me, it's a civil feat, maybe. The organization Florence of the Parisia was named after its founders, Professor Florence and Otto Drieger, and offered a cooperation program with the Parisia University. The project was intended to provide psychological social assistance for families in crisis. Now it's time to mention the history project. The first contacts between the Canadian Mennonites and Ukrainian scholars go back to the early 1990s. Professor Harvey Dick visited Zaporizhia to do research in the state regional archives. The role of Harvey Dick in the promotion and elucidation of Mennonite history is unprecedented. He may have been the first Canadian historian to visit regional museum of history. A very quick glance around the exposition led to predictable conclusions. The history of the Mennonite communities was absent from using the displays. Following successful negotiation with official, the decision about a new exhibition was made. Professor Harvey D. communicated with Mennonite communities in Canada and specialists from the Royal Ontario Museums. Also, he initiated a fundraising campaign Ukrainian historian from Ukrainian German Research Center were also involved in developing the concept of the exhibit. The opening of the exposition in May 1999 was synchronized with the International Historical Conference in Zaporizhia. Later, the exposition was transferred to the Dnipro Museum. It is important that during that time both casual visitors and school undergraduate students were able to visit it. Thus, Mennonite history appeared in the school and university programs. Equally significant, uh, significant were their perspectives and uh, contributions of Ukrainian historians. A Mennonite library-related project and grants for the dissertation thesis on Mennonite history also contributed to international collaboration. Meanwhile, Harvey Dick and local historians from the Ukrainian German Research Center made a joint decision to organize a big international conference. The, the academic forum took place in 1999 the next one was successfully held in 2004. 10 of 39 papers were presented by Western historians. The conference also included thematic exhibitions in Zaporizhia, Melitopol, and Dnipro. It was arranged that Peter Lenkeman spoke to the students of the Parisian National University before the conference. He started conversation about political, national, and religious persecutions that decimated his religious community with a quote from Solzhenitsyn book, The Gulag Archipelago. No matter how terrible the past was, its obliviation can predetermine even more terrible future. 
The correspondence between Peter Letkeman and Harvey Dick shows that the Mennonites expected Ukrainian society not only to understand their history, but also recognize a special, greater degree of suffering that this ethnic and religious community experienced during the repressions. The Mennonites were not confident that they would have support. However, they were hurt by Russian Ukrainians, by, sorry, but Ukrainians. Commemorate, commemorative practices. The knowledge about Mennonite history gradually spread thanks to conferences, education, and the media. About 20 years ago, the Mennonite established the International Memorial Committee. This public body was to promote memorial projects in Ukraine, and it was run by Mennonite historians Paul Taves, Peter Klaas, and Harvey Dick. The commemorative events were intended to the public. Local residents, secondary school students, officials, and representatives of the Orthodox Church were invited. The first memorial plaques were installed on the former Mennonite church in Zaporizhia and a monument on a cemetery located on the island of Hortitsa. Speaking at the one of event, the local Orthodox priest, Father Vasily, admitted that as a Ukrainian, he felt ashamed of what happened to Mennonites on this land. These words were very important for Mennonites because they, they, didn't got, they didn't get, you know, official apology, but they received moral compensation from original, from just common Ukrainians. Canadian designer Paul Epp collaborated with the Memorial Committee and on a voluntary basis, he designed several important projects. Monuments to the victims of the Einhenfeld and Ebenfeld, monuments in Molchansk and Svetlodolinsk. There are the, mon the, the monuments, these are the monuments, and a short description of them by the author Paul Epp. So it is about Eichenfeld, and it is a tragedy connected to Mahno. And because of sadness and unexpectedness of their death, of the death of all the village, and the absence of survivors, they were denied and the dignity of a proper burial. My guiding in image for these monuments is that of a coffin set out for viewing resting on short support, title upwards and the hot end. It becomes the viewing that these people should have had. Ebenfeld. This Mennonite memorial also commemorates the site of a mass grave and the massacre of an entire village. The symbolism is that of mill wheel. The view will have to the view will have to walk around maybe viewer. Yes, will have to walk around the stone to read their inscription with a bowed head. Molchansk <laughs> 2002. The symbolism is that the symbolism is that of threshing stone here placed upright on a plinth. And last two memories uh, by App were about the uh, political repression. Uh, against not only Mennonites, but all the local population. And this, the monument to the left, is called in Ukraine just missing people. It is located in a park in the section of the Parisian known as Hortica. During the 1930s, the Mennonites who remained in this part of the world 
were purged. The men, typically were short, and the women and children dispersed uh, to far eastern parts of the Soviet Union. This monument has its guiding image that of mental peace with family pictured on it. In this case, so only their profiles remain. The people have been disappeared. Uh, this was the case for those uh, unfortunate people who did not have a chance to be properly remembered. And also we should say about uh, necropolis. Mennonite cemeteries have been the focus of attention for Mennonites since their first visits to Ukraine. Mennonites tried and even succeeded in bringing some gravestones to Canada and the USA. Just one example, Maria Schroeder's gravestone exhibited in the CMU gallery. It was successfully evacuated by the years in 1990s. But about 20 years later, the Kortica National Reserve in Zaporizhia became the home of the memorial of the Mennonites in, of Kortica project. The project was initiated by a group of of enthusiasts in Canada in 2018 with Werner Chaves and Brent Weber as the curators. Currently, the exhibit features only 15 tombstones, but I anticipate that their number will grow. Despite the ongoing war, new discoveries continue to emerge. In the autumn of 2023, a student from Dnipropetrovsk University came across three tombstones belonging to the children from the Hermann Bergman family, very famous family in, in Russia. It is a literal sense that return of Mennonites to the historical landscape of South Ukraine was reaffirmed by the policy of decommunization. A number of names associated with this congregation can be found in the toponymy of Zaporizhia, Dnipro, and Berdyansk. In Molochansk, many pre-Soviet ideologically neutral names were restored during their decommunization. As for the role of the Mennonite population, it found reflections in the town's anthem. Here, Cossacks, Chaikas traversed the vastness of the Milky River. The Mennonites founded, uh, founded you. You became known as Halbstadt forever. It's my translation, maybe not very successful, uh, but it's understood the content. This simple, easy to remember words confirm the local recognition of Mennonite heritage and the success of the Mennonite return to Ukraine. Conclusions. Summing up the first decades of the activity of Mennonites, Paul Taves wrote, the Ukrainians and the Mennonites from different countries are collaborating together. Humanitarian with humanitarian agencies, churches and church associations, universities and archives, agricultural cooperatives and small businesses. The Mennonites can again inspire people who have suffered for a long time and for whom the despair was endless. They make easier life of old people and feeble, feeble people, provide medical care to those who are in need, carry on various social practices, create conditions for social justice, support new research to understand our shared history. In fact, Quite practical things are behind these stirring words. In the midst of upheaval and moral revolution in which Ukraine and its people found themselves after gaining independence, the Mennonite communities successfully organized a dialogue with Ukrainian society. I believe that such return to historical memory helped this group to heal its own social trauma caused both by the loss of the motherland and by the unjust obliviation by the Bolshevik regime. It was crucially important for the Mennonites to be visible in the public and historical context of Ukraine. The philanthropic and commemorative projects were inspired by their sense of duty to their forebears as well as to their former fatherland. 
And these kinds of social activities were very organic for the Mennonites. This public form of returning, returning as a community, brought together Mennonites and those representatives of the local population who became familiar with recognized, accepted Mennonite culture and became a part of their historical past. The outcomes of public commemorative events stressing the idea of shared historical destinies, as well as charitable projects functioning on a permanent basis, was that the Ukrainians came to perceive the Mennonites as their former neighbors and fellow citizens. Academic programs supported research concerning the history of German population, not only Mennonite in Ukraine. Mennonite toponyms appeared on city maps, and the memorial landscape of citizen villages welcomed landmarks honoring the memory of the ethno confessional community. Under these war conditions, Mennonites are still present in Ukraine, running some of their programs. They serve as an example of a responsible approach to both the past and the present. Mennonite congregation now remain dedicated to Ukraine in times of prosperity and adversity. Thank you. Professor Wenger. Yes, so some of you, while you heard the lecture, may have a question. This is, this is the time when you can pose the question. There's a mic right here in the center. If you want to make your way to the front here, and Professor will respond. Thank you for the lecture. Mm -hmm. um, it's probably safe to say that most of us here are Mennonites. Yeah. And we're here because we're interested in Mennonite history. I'm just curious, what was it about, or what is it about Mennonite culture, about Mennonite history, that you devoted your academic life to it? Mm -hmm. uh, so the question was why, or, yeah, why? It's, it's actually, it's everything, it often happens very accidentally. So when um, I graduated from university in 1990s, and it was a period of history upheaval of in Ukraine, I mentioned about that. And it was a period of democratization and um, a, lot of, a lot of collections, foundations from archives that had been closed for the public before the independence, they were opened. And when I came to my uh, future guide for my a PhD, he sent me to a archive to check the situation. So, and then I spent maybe a week in the archive and came to him back and I said that probably I find the field for my research maybe for all my life. So it just happened because it was a very good foundation collection of Guardian Committee in Dnipropetrovsk. Because for my Dnipropetrov's Nikro name was Katerinoslav, and Katerinoslav was a place where Guardian Committee office uh, took place, used to be. <laughs> Thank you for your question. It's not just about me. You know, it was important, I mentioned Harvey Dick when he went, and he, Harvey Dick, what he could do, he could ask questions. And he asked questions, and those questions were very sophisticated and interesting about Mennonite history. And he was very demanding, demanding when you ask, answered him. So, and it was a kind of stimul to continue research and to find the answer to these questions. So it's not just about me, a lot of people were involved in Mennonite history because of Mennonite return to Ukraine. Repeat. Hello. Professor Wenger, my name is Harry, a CMU student. 
So uh, during your lecture, I just noticed uh, there's a scholar named A.I. Raymer, and he just mentioned so many years ago, Mennonite had better equipment in Ukraine. So it comes to my question, which is, do you think um, the persecution for Ukrainian Mennonites during time to, from time to time is more because of the cultural difference or is more because of the religious conflicts? or is more because of the uh, interest dispute? Okay, okay, not only. So all, the, all in one. It because of nationalism. So in the, it, it was about my previous lecture. In the middle of 19th century, it was a period when Russian Empire became a nationalizing empire. So when that, if, are you history major, no? No, I'm history. Oh, okay, so. Uh, maybe history major knows that uh, you know nationalism is a uh, phenomenon phenomenon that appears when uh, the state starts thinking about what is nation, and two questions appears: who are is in the nation, and who are beyond in the nation. In the Russian Empire, I'm sorry that I start from 19th century. In the Russian Empire. You know, in the nations were included just Russian-speaking people and Orthodox people. And I told in the morning that, you know, some politicians thought that they, they had to look for patriots only among the Russian Orthodox. All the other people are beyond the nations, so you are kind of second-rate people. And it was also a very good question in the morning about the, uh, how often the government used the Mennonite case to deflect sometimes from particular social problems. When it happens something in the society, they always to say that it, it how their nationalism works. They always to say that it's not the government guilty, it's maybe the Mennonites are guilty, the Jews are guilty, the Protestants are guilty, so somebody else. Do you understand? Yeah, I'm sorry for this long answer. So it's my, my so to, to come the long story short, uh, it was about that Mennonites communities were considered as a group that was beyond the nation, okay? Beyond the Russian nation. That is why persecutions. Yeah, so during this Christmas, I visited the uh, Ukrainian museum in Chicago. And those people, like those staff members in the museum, just gave me some very negative description for Mennonites during the history that in Ukraine. Is. So I was like a little bit confused. So that's the, that's the question. I don't know. Just it's... It's, it's not typical for Ukraine. Maybe it's typical for Chicago. Mm -hmm. Because they, they're, not, you know, they're not in the topic, yes? Right, they, right. Uh, actually, we should confess that Mennonites, it's not very large group, yes? And a lot of people don't know who are Mennonites. Right, right. So that is why. In Ukraine, Mennonites are accepted. I just swear. <laughs> and so, and... So we are very, we are very welcome, everybody, and every group who are our friends. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, Thank you answer. for your question. Yeah. <laughs> I just have a. I presume you did your research in uh, in the Ukraine. And I'm just wondering about how, uh, how the material, like how, how much history is there in, in the Ukraine and the archives and the libraries or wherever? A lot of, a lot of. Yes, so um, as a researcher, I, and for my two subjects, for my main subjects, for my two books, uh, and I studied early Soviet periods and I uh, studied imperial periods, so in Ukraine, if you ask about Ukraine, it's a few 
very helpful archives, Dnipro archive, Kiev archive, Kherson archive, Nikolayan archives, yes, I should say archives. So, Nikolayev archives. Unfortunately, Kherson is, it's now, it was uh, deliberated, but before it was occupy, occupied by Russian army, when the war started, Kherson archive, uh, Kherson was occupied and, you know, the Russian Federation took all the valuable things, just stole from archives and from museums. Art museums, archives, and so we don't know how it's going on, how it will be solved after the war. Hi, I'm Hi. enjoying this. Uh, I was just wondering, I read a book called um, My Harp is Turned to Mourning by Al Reimer. By whom? Al Reimer. Mm -hmm. And uh, he describes characters in the book, Mennonite characters, and they seem to have a bit of a condescending attitude towards the people there live with them in Russia. And, it, and then when the revolution comes, it it really works against the Mennonites. And I'm just wondering if you find that there's any truth to that, to what yes, you Yes, some truth, because, yeah. you know, life is different. Life is multicultural. And so when um, I... I'm now trying, it's actually very good questions, because I'm trying also research now um, a topic of resentment, resentment of uh, maybe neighboring population about the Ukraine. And so there were a lot of different things when, you know, people were dissatisfied with the Mennonites because it's always a personal history. And for example, now I'm Aline, we are preparing publication of the article about a Mennonite, so-called Mennonite trainee. So everybody knows who is um, Johann Kornis, yes, here. And so one of his great projects, I mentioned in the morning, his great project was to train the young people from, uh, from neighboring villages of Russian, or Russian Ukrainian, because a lot of Ukrainian surnames, Russian Ukrainian villages. And so teenagers were given to Mennonites to teach them agriculture. Some of them, just died while they were with Cornis. But it was not because Cornis didn't feed them. It because they were given in a you know, bad health condition. But what about rumors? So the people from neighbors said, well, we are giving children to Cornis, but our children are maybe killed, or I don't know by them. So it's it could be, it could be, but, but I can offer a lot of, you know, other examples when Mennonites thought about uh, their people. So when their workers, a lot of workers were hired by Mennonites and they, they were fed very good. They were given, you know, ham, etc. And I know the testimony from a girl, she was Orthodox girl, and it was a period when it was forbidden to eat meat, you know, in Orthodoxy. So, and she got the ham, that is actually very expensive, very good food, and he went to the, to the garden and dig it. Dig it. <laughs> so, it's, it's a lot of, but uh, always when I, when I, read something about the connections between the Mennonites and their workers, actually it was not bad. It was not just bad connections. So Mennonites were, oh, Mennonites made their workers to eat because they said, I need you be in good condition. I want you to be a good worker tomorrow. So sit and have your dinner. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, thank you for your lecture. Uh, it's, it's interesting to hear somebody who's not connected uh, deliberately, maybe uh, you wish you were a Mennonite, but you're probably not a Mennonite, uh, <clears throat> and uh, to, to give a, a perhaps a more uh, direct and maybe even a secular perspective on our history. When you did your research, we, we, we assume as Mennonites that we're a biblical people. So were there references to the biblical narrative that informed and uh, uh, identified, uh, provided an identity for the Mennonites in their deliberations with, with the powers that be and so on? In other words, uh, thinking especially about pacifism and, and that kind of thing, as well as community. Were there some biblical references that stuck out for you? Yes, as a, you know, as a mostly secular historian, of course, I find something. So I, of course, I invoke to the Bible when I explain some views of Mennonites and their way of behavior. Uh, but mostly, uh, but mostly, of course, I use that I don't know how to answer your questions. I just use their... Uh, because Mennonites, they used to live in two worlds. Yeah, in religious and just uh, always in just everyday world. Uh, and uh, so their, their behavior was different. And the late is the more, the late is the more, so in the 19th century, we saw a lot of Mennonites who were not very religious, actually. And when we say about uh, the entrepreneurs, business as usual, works, you know, was more persuasive for them very often. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Natalia, for that address. I'm full of nostalgia, you know, it's been 25 years since um, I first met you <laughs> at the Zaporozhia 1999 conference. Oh yeah, it's impressive. And I yeah. want to thank, thank you for... Time flies. <laughs> time flies. <laughs> and, and a generation... But, but we, sorry, sorry for interrupted, but we haven't changed, yes? No, no, yeah. no, we're still on the cutting, cutting edge. So I have two questions. One is a kind of a Harvey Dick question, maybe. So. It, and the other one is just a technical question, but which might be actually more complex than the first one. So do you think there's a parallel? So, I mean, men us like to feel guilty, so we like to feel guilty about Ukraine. You know, when we were there and we looked down on the uh, Ukrainian workers, and you so say, can, we, fed, we you... fed them meat, so we shouldn't feel that guilty. But isn't there a parallel? Um, weren't we colonizers, in a way, displacing you know, um, for lack of a better term, indigenous people to the land? And is there a parallel between us in Manitoba today, celebrating 150 years, and um, Mennonites in Ukraine? That's, that's a meteor question. Okay. The other one is just technical. And, and it's something I wonder about all the time, and I guess I could ask Aileen or other people, like, so if we're talking about Mennonites coming from 19th century to Manitoba, do we say they came from Russia? Do we say they came from South Russia? Do we say they came from New Russia? Do we say they came from Ukraine? What's the, uh, you're the expert. Tell us how to, what, what term we can use. Okay, can I, can I start with the second one? So actually it's important the self-identification things. So we can't church, we can't, we can't think that, um, charge this question. So, and if I take even Cornelius Kran and uh, Peter Rampal's, uh, uh, you know, uh, books, they say Russia. They say Russia, so. And actually Mennonites uh, who, uh, who resettlement to Ukrainian lands and they, they called their, as their Russian subjects and after then. But I'm Ukrainian historian, but I don't want to violate, violate history, yes. It's, it's not good for historians to violate history. So that is why I used, where are you? 
Oh, okay. <laughs> that is why I used often in my, you know, books uh, a kind of expression, the Mennonites on the Ukrainian lands of the Russian Empire. That is what I say. But if Mennonites don't consider themselves as a Ukrainian Mennonites, we should trust them. It's their choice. And the second was about the parallels. Uh, must confess that I'm not deeply in Canadian history. I just started, it's, it's because, very interesting things, many of people in Canada don't know Ukrainian history. Because when they go to school, they start learning just Russia history, and Ukraine was a kind of a dandrum, yes, for them. That is the same situation as with Canada. When I was a student, I went to university, I studied the history of USA. And I don't know enough, you know, Canadian history, actually. So, confederation, some things that are, you know, common, of course, we know. So, to, uh, probably I'm not an expert for deep analysis. Uh, but what, what is almost the same, it is, you know, the theory, and some people advised me to read some, um, uh, some pieces about that, about the uh, colonial, uh, let me see, help me with words? No. Elin? One more? Yeah, so if we use this phenomenon, so it can be used, it can be used, it's very practical to use for Ukraine and for, uh, and for Canada. So I think that as a methodology for this, it uh, can be very helpful. Uh, that is all. Yeah, so, are we done? Oh, Peter. So, yeah, I could be miss if you don't ask questions. <laughs> um, as one who's been involved with tours and with these projects here, I wonder too, but what's, the, what's impelling us to be involved? And I'm now coming to the notion that because our people left under such traumatic, traumatizing situations, there's a deeper need and a deeper process need to kind of come to terms and understand and return than there is maybe for other groups that have immigrated to Canada and have left homelands behind. It's the level of trauma with which many of our people left. So there is, there is Ukrainian proverb. If you are happy, don't come to the places where were you happy. No, just, sorry, I change, I tend, I tend. It's better, it's, it's better to translate differently. Uh, if you are looking for happiness, don't come to the place where we used to be happy. Yeah, because you can't find the same, you're indifferent. But if you are miserable, came to that place, Maybe physically, or virtually, or psychologically. And so what psycho are, are we having psychologists here? Probably psychologists need that we have to elaborate our traumas. So I think that this tour are uh, very good for elaborating. And so all kind of nostalgia, nostalgia tours are important for you know, elaborating something uh, former what happens to you. Okay, thank you very much. And please, I'd like everyone to come and... Thank you. Yes, join us a big round of applause. Okay. Yes. And thank you for your questions.
Thank you very much. I'd just like to conclude our uh, Friesen lectures and take a moment to express some gratitude to some uh, folks. We're, of course, grateful to the Friesen family for their funding and the vision that makes this annual lecture series possible. And I want to also acknowledge the very good work of my fellow committee members, Conrad Stace and uh, John Isaac. It's a pleasure to work with you. Um, these kinds of events uh, depend on an infrastructure that, when it works, is virtually invisible. And uh, I'm very, very grateful for the people in communications and marketing, the hosting department, uh, people working with audiovisual, which reminds me that these lectures will, in fact, be posted along with uh, F Professor Wenger's slides uh, on our website. Uh, I'm promised that they will be up there by about the 23rd. And I'm also grateful for our colleagues at the University of Winnipeg, the Centre for Transnational Mennonite Studies, the Platt Foundation, the Chair of Mennonite Studies, for making it possible for Professor Wenger to take up her current research uh, position. And I'm very grateful uh, to you, Natalia, for uh, it, it's, uh, it's not only a delight to hear you here, but it's, uh, it's been a wonderful experience to be able to work with you alongside as we worked through titles and uh, conceptualizing this series. Thank you very much for your kindness and your graciousness. Um, so, uh, please let me express my uh, sincere gratitude for your very fine work. Thank you.